Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 389. Welcome back to the program. A few updates. Some of you have been sending me messages about Skull and Crown Limited. If you're curious about what's going on there, then head on over to skullandcrownltd.com and follow our project. I've still not totally announced what it is, but uh, those of you who are following on Instagram have seen the updates and some of the pictures of the R&D that we're doing to put together something really cool there. In other news, went ahead and met with the two other gentlemen. Now, I will release this tidbit right now. There's going to be another podcast. That's all I can tell you right now, guys. It's going to be wonderful, not what you're expecting. Stay tuned for details. Thanks to everybody out there who is helping us out by subscribing on our YouTube channel. Find us on YouTube under Whence Came You or WCY Podcast. And this week I've got three, that's right, three papers for you, all of which are very interesting. I quite enjoyed reading them, so I thought I'd bring them to you. We've got one that comes straight from a listener of the program about memorization. I've got one on the history of ritual, and I've got another that deals with the past master. So, before we get into all that, I did want to quickly mention the next big thing happening is Masonicon 2019. Saturday, April 27th, 2019, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Located in Attleboro, Massachusetts, we're going to be at Ezekiel Bates Lodge. If you go to eb one eight seven zero. Dot .org 1870 that's not the number of the lodge that's the year it was chartered 1870 you can find the event on facebook as well i'm going to go ahead and name off the speaker lineup this year for masonicon brother john michael greer will be speaking on masonry and the secret societies right worshipful walter hunt merging grand lodges brother shy offsai franklin and judaism the prince the sage, and the rabbi. Brother Chris Douglas, Tombstone Territorial Lodge Number 5. Worshipful Brother Ryan Flynn will be talking about the Divine Master. Worshipful Brother Ben Wallace will be talking about the Middle Chamber, the Grand Lodge of North Carolina's program to explain the philosophical aspect of the craft. I highly recommend that one, guys. It's going to be on at 2 p.m. Ben does a wonderful job explaining this, and I think you all will really enjoy it. Dr. Craig Williams will be talking about the metaphysics, masculinity, and the spiritual warrior in contemporary times. We've got Brother William Kolosansky. He'll be doing sound frequency, healing with sacred geometry and music, and Brother Nicholas Harvey and worship Brother David Riley on a better Masonic education. So it's going to be a fun-filled day presentations start at 9 a.m. and they go, I think, until almost 6 p.m. The last one starts at 5 p.m. that day. Vendors are going to be all over the place. There looks to be tons of vendors here and specific Masonic groups will be there. It's more vendors than your Grand Lodge brings in for sure. And of course, the Masonic Roundtable will be there as well. I'll be there with John Ruark, Jason Richards, Juan Sepulveda, and Mike Hambricht. So uh, I'll be there representing Skull and Crown Limited as well as the Masonic Round Table and Whence Came You, of course. So we'll see you guys there. And let's go ahead and get right into these papers right after this. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYPodcast.com, you can click on Direct Donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beard and Skin Care. He's been so generous 
If you head to WCYpodcast.com, click on More, then click on Banker's Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more then go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to on it.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print even on ibooks and last but not least i want to ask you to check out the great books program you'll see the banner for it on the left hand side intellectual linear progression use the promo code wcy or you can just click on that link there and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from scott hambrick about how awesome the program is so that's it i hope you guys enjoy and thank you so much for helping us out. So the first thing that I wanted to read for you is actually an email that I got from worshipful brother John Gebhardt. He says, Brother Johnson, I'd like to add my voice to the discussion on memorizing our ritual. I'm a past master of Mercer Island Lodge, number 297 in Mercer Island, Washington, right next to Seattle. In our jurisdiction, there is an ongoing discussion on the merits of memorizing versus reading the ritual really well. I'm a proponent of the latter. I publish a newsletter for the lodges in my district and open each edition with an editorial. Below is an editorial on this topic. Please feel free to use this as you see fit. Fraternally, Worshipful Brother, John Gebhardt. So, let me just read you this short editorial. Listen. If you haven't read the Lodge Officer's Handbook, I suggest you do. There's page after page of useful how-to guidance, everything from how to set up the lodge room to how to greet Grand Lodge officers. I'll save you all the time it takes to find it. Click here. John then provides the link, which we'll put in the show notes for you guys to check out. He continues. There is one page, however, that you should skip. Page 58, which provides suggestions for learning the rituals, specifically the advice is that all officers memorize the ritual. I'm more than a little offended by this guidance. Quote, Past Grandmaster Conrad Hahn, Connecticut, described it in this manner. No brother should be elected or appointed to a lodge office if he is unwilling or unable to memorize the ritual of the three degrees. Exceedingly few men are really unable to memorize. Usually, the inability to memorize is used as an excuse for unwillingness to make the effort to do so. Almost everyone can memorize if he applies himself. End quote. So I guess brothers who don't memorize are inferior. They're lazy, lacking commitment, or both. If the handbook authors meant to phrase advice in the most friendly manner, they failed. And the tone is hardly on the level, which is a serious lapse on someone's part. I greatly admire brothers who are able to memorize, but I think nothing less of those who can't. Whether their brains just don't work that way, or they have other priorities that keep them from studying, there are still good men that we should all be proud to call brothers. I think a better way to prepare for the ritual is to learn what it means, and then really think about it. Read it silently, and then read it aloud. Consider making index cards that can be read, and read well, during Lodge without having to flip through the standard work. There are many benefits of this more pragmatic approach. 
Here's just one. All those past masters will no longer be listening for mistakes they can eagerly correct. Instead, they'll just listen. Worshipful brother, John Gebhardt. So, an interesting approach. Now, in my home jurisdiction, we are not allowed to read anything, and I'm not sure how many jurisdictions actually do allow this. Every day I learn something new about a foreign jurisdiction in which there are additional things or subtracted things from our home ritual, things that I see in 15 other lodges around the country. There are lodges that don't have that part or don't do this thing. And in this case, it sounds as if they're allowed to do some sort of reading, but maybe not all of it. I'm curious. I'd like to know what you guys think about this particular practice. Would reading it really well from note cards or something be more effective than memory work and having people shout in from the sidelines correcting you? Or what do you guys think? Again, I know what I think, but I don't want to taint the conversation. So I'll go ahead and put that out for you all and have some conversation on the Facebook page. All right, next up, I have a piece called The Past Master. It's a short talk bulletin, volume number nine, January 1931. Number one, by our favorite brother, Unknown. Fortunate, the lodge which has many. Poor, that body of masonry in which past masters have lost the interest with with which they once presided in the East. The honorable station of past master is usually honored by the brethren. Generally, it is considered as second in importance only to that of the presiding master, and he is a wise, good master who sees to it that the brethren of his lodge understand that past master is no empty title, but carries with it certain rights and privileges, certain duties and responsibilities, all set forth in the general body of Masonic law, although differing in some respects in different jurisdictions. Certain unwritten attributes, which become more or less important according to the character and abilities of the individual past master. It has been well settled in this country, as it is in England, that a past master has no inherent, inviolable right of membership in the Grand Lodge, such as is possessed by the master of a lodge. But in many American jurisdictions, by action of the Grand Lodge, past masters are members of the Grand Lodge. In Nevada, all master masons are members of the Grand Lodge, but only the three principal officers and one among all past masters of a particular lodge are considered voting members of the Grand Lodge. In some jurisdictions, they are full voting members. In others, they have but a fraction of a vote, all the past masters of a lodge having one vote between them on any Grand Lodge question to be decided by a vote by lodges. Whether full voting members of Grand Lodge or members with but a fraction of a vote, they are such by action of their own Grand Lodge, and not by inherent right. Before the formation of the Mother Grand Lodge in England, when general assemblies of Masons were held, past masters were as much a part of that body as the members of the craft. But the old constitutions of the Mother Grand Lodge did not recognize past masters as members of the Grand Lodge. Dermot's Ahiman Rezon of 1778, quoting Anderson's edition of the Old and New Regulations, says, quote, Past masters of warranted lodges on record are allowed this privilege, membership in Grand Lodge, while they continue to be members of any regular lodge, end quote. But his previous edition of this same work does not contain this statement. And Preston refers to the Grand Lodge at the laying of the cornerstone of Covent Garden Theatre in London by the Prince of Wales as Grand Master in these words, quote, The Grand Lodge was opened by Charles March, Esquire, attended by the masters and wardens of all the regular lodges, end quote. He does not mention past masters as part of the Grand Lodge. These past masters, of course, having long since gone the way of all flesh, past masters who are now members of Grand Lodges are made so by the action of those Grand Lodges, and not by any inherent right. But the very fact that a past master may receive such recognition at the hands of his Grand Lodge, which ordinarily would not be given to brethren, not past masters, except wardens, must be considered as one of the rights and privileges of a past master. Past masters are said by Mackey to possess the right to preside over their lodges in the absence of the master, and on the invitation of the senior warden, or, in his absence, the junior warden. According to the ancient laws of masonry, which gives a master very large powers, 
Any master mason may be called to the chair by a master. Here, the question is as to who may be called to the chair by a warden who has congregated the lodge in the absence of a master. The great Masonic jurist gives unqualified endorsement to the idea that then only a warden or a past master with the consent of the preceding warden can preside over a lodge and counts this as among the rights of a past master. However true this may be in this specific case, the practice and the law in many jurisdictions gives to the master the right to put any brother in the chair for the time being, remaining, of course, responsible for the acts of his temporary appointee and for the acts of his lodge during such incumbency. It may be considered a moot question as to just when a master becomes a past master. He is installed as master, quote, until your successor be regularly elected and installed, end quote. From this point of view, the master is master until his successor has been made master by installation. In other words, the right to install his successor is inherent in the office of master and not past master. Under the law of masonry, however, for this purpose, masters and past masters are identical. The master really becomes a past master when, after the election, he passes the chair, in an emergent lodge of past masters, or when, as a virtual past master, made so in a chapter, he is elected master of his lodge. In those few American jurisdictions in which the elected master is not required to receive the past master's degree prior to installation, a master does not become a past master until his successor is installed. The right to install his successor is inherent. The privilege of delegating that duty to another is within the power of any worshipful master. Courtesy would indicate that the desires of the senior warden be considered for installing officer, as well as the date for the installation. He should not delegate the installing power to any brother who has not himself been installed in order that the succession of the oriental chair be unbroken from regularly installed master to master elect, regularly to be installed. Therefore, in most jurisdictions, the installation power, which is the right of the master, may be considered also a privilege of past masters. A very important right of all past masters is that of being elected to the office of master, without again serving as warden. Perhaps no regulation is more jealously guarded by Grand Lodges than this, which dates to print from 1722 in the Old Charges, that no Mason may be elected or installed as a master who has not been regularly elected, installed, and served as warden. There are exceptions when a new lodge is constituted. A brother who has not been regularly elected, installed, and served as a warden may be elected and installed as master, in Nevada, it is permissible for any master mason to be elected and installed as worshipful master. When no warden in a lodge will accept election to the east, a brother may be elected from the floor, provided a dispensation is secured from the grand master. A past master may be elected master of a lodge, whether the lodge over which he once presided or another is immaterial, without dispensation. There you have it, kind of an interesting piece on the past master, written in a way very legal sounding. The takeaways from this are quite interesting in that in the state of Illinois, you do, of course, have to serve as a warden before you can be made a master of a lodge. There are special circumstances in which a grand master may grant a dispensation to somebody who has not done this. Something else I found interesting was the fact that lodges require or at least did require, a master of a lodge to have the past master degree from the Royal Arch before being installed in the chair. That is not something that Illinois does. And something else is that uh, we do not require any portion of the Royal Arch degrees, including the Holy Royal Arch degree, be conferred upon any member of Craft Lodge in any office prior to joining that office. So I understand that in some jurisdictions, somebody has to have the capstone, right? The seventh degree, the Royal Arch degree before becoming a master of a lodge. That is not the case here in Illinois. I find those are very interesting things. I wonder how far those date back and if really they have more to do with saving the chapter than anything else. In any case, let's get to this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother, Stephen L. Harrison. Years ago, my wife Carolyn and I sat in a restaurant 
having dinner with my father, Robert, when an energetic man walked up to the table and introduced himself to Dad. It seemed as if the pair were old friends. Turns out, they had never met before. They were, in fact, both Freemasons, and the man, Lester Brown, who came up to our table, had seen the shrine pin my father always wore. They shared stories comparing information about their lodges and other Masonic activities. And then Lester looked at me and asked, what about this young man? Is he a Mason? Lester was immediately a friend because he called me young. Despite that, however, I gave him my standard answer about joining the fraternity. Someday. It wasn't too long after that when Someday finally arrived, and I became an entered apprentice. Lester was at my initiation, and so was my dad. When I became master of my lodge, I asked Lester to be my installing senior deacon. That evening, I asked him about the time we met in the restaurant. When you asked me if I was a Mason, what would you have thought if I had said, I plan to join and someday you'd help install me as master of your lodge? I'd have said you were nuts, snorted Lester. A few years after that auspicious dinner, Dad passed away. I had by then taken part in several Masonic services, but never with a speaking part. That day, the master asked if I would like to be the chaplain in Dad's service. I don't know the part, I said, but I would be honored to read it. A few years later, Lester, at the age of 100, entered that house not made with hands. Standing in line waiting for his Masonic service, the master asked if I would be chaplain. I don't know the part, I said, but I would be honored to read it. Those are the only two Masonic funerals I have ever participated in with a speaking part. As we were marching in procession out of Lester's service, I thought back to the dinner where we met. Not yet a Mason, I eventually would take part as the craft said goodbye to two brothers who were there for me at the beginning of my Masonic experience. It's probably just a coincidence it happened that way. Insignificant, really. However, for me, personally, it has great significance. They both helped me start on my Masonic journey, and it was a humbling honor to give back just a little bit. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. Hello, Whence Came You fans. This is Brother Joe Martinez from Manassas, Virginia. Your illustrious host, Brother Robert Johnson, has allowed me to take a few seconds of his program to remind you about our very special event, the inaugural Mid-Atlantic Esotericon, which will be held on June 15, 2019 at Manassas Lodge No. 182 in Manassas, Virginia. This all-day event will include both tiled and untiled presentations from many of your favorite esoteric authors and speakers to include John T. Ruark, Frater O., Greg Kaminsky, P.D. Newman, Pierce Vaughn, Jamie Lamb, Don McAndrews, and your very own Robert Johnson. Vendors will include the ever-popular Masonic Revival and Ascended Masters Clothing. Lunch will be catered, with coffee and snacks available throughout the entire day. Tickets have been selling quickly, and we do have a limited seating capacity, so do not miss out. The brew night on June 14th is already sold out, and tickets for the event will be sold until we run out or April 15th, 2019, whichever comes first. For more information, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash MA Esotericon. Or to purchase tickets, please visit tinyurl.com forward slash MA Esotericon. Or search eventbrite.com for Mid Atlantic Esotericon. If you're looking for a more introspective, thought provoking, 
and deeply engaging way to start your summer, look no further than the Mid-Atlantic Esotericon. Again, tickets are going very quickly, so get yours today. And as always, thank you to my dear brother, Robert Johnson, for this time to promote what will certainly be an event to remember. Many thanks to illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison for his awesome work with the Masonic Minute. If you like those, please check out the YouTube channel. He creates videos to go along with those, and they do really well when you compile them into playlists and you put them on at days where you're open to the public or you're giving lodge tours or that kind of thing. They, they do really well. Also want to say thanks again to Brother Joe, who's put together the information for Esotericon for us. Brother Joe just announced the latest round of speakers, uh, which will include Brother John Ruark, who will be talking on some really interesting stuff, as well as our prolific Brother Greg Kaminsky will be there also. Some really heavy hitters coming to this. This is not going to be an event for anybody who is not into thinking. If you are not somebody who is comfortable with thinking about things that are hard to think about, then this is not going to be for you. But if you are one of those brothers who is okay with turning the radio off and asking yourself odd questions on the drive home, if you're one of those brothers who stares at the ceiling and wonders about existence, if you're one of those brothers who is curious about theology, those things are super contemplative and you would very much enjoy Esotericon. So I invite you to come on out to Esotericon. Now the last piece I have for you this week is called The History of Our Ritual by Ira Gilbert, past master, past district deputy grandmaster, and this comes from page 42 of the Illinois Lodge of Research in volume number 21. Here we go. The great French novelist, Gustave Flaubert, remarked, quote, history is prophecy looking backward, end quote. At the commencement of speculative Freemasonry, who would have predicted the success this fledgling fraternity would achieve? Now, from the perspective of looking backward, we need to learn from our successors so that our brotherhood can continue long into the future. I believe that the answer to our long and fruitful existence lies in the ritual. It is the words that are contained in our ritual and the meaning attached to those words that induced our Masonic brethren to wish to not only be a Freemason, but to increase our membership. The material for this article comes from the article entitled The History of Our Ritual, printed in the Builder magazine in its issue December 1915. As I will set forth in this instant article, there is much to be learned from our past. The author of the article laments on the thousands upon thousands of candidates that annually pass through the ceremonies of the several degrees conferred in Masonic lodges, but very few know anything of the history of the ritual of the order. He goes on further to remark that there is a strong aversion to making any change in the ritual for fear that the ancient ways of our fraternity may be infringed or obliterated. This belief persists today. Our ritual is set in stone that it can be changed only through a long practice of passing from the board of grand examiners through the most worshipful grand master and those officers of our grand line. This is a laudable belief since it ensures that there is a stable and long-lasting life to our brotherhood. It also ensures that there will be no change in Freemasonry by those who are not qualified to make those changes. It ensures that changes will only be made by those who have an appreciation of the ancient usage of our order, so that Freemasonry, as it exists in current time, not only be preserved, but keep up with the times as situations change. There are those who believe that every change in the ritual is a stab in the heart of our venerated institution and shake the very foundation of the very temple itself. Prior to the formation of the first Grand Lodge of Speculative Masons in the year 1717, Freemasonry consisted of independent lodges of operative masons. There may have been an occasional assembly of lodges where information necessary for the operation of the order was disseminated. However, there were secrets of the teachings of the craft that needed to be communicated to other brethren. If the masters of the lodge and the intenders who were tasked with teaching the craft to the new entered apprentices and fellow crafts were literate and able to communicate their knowledge, all was well. But if those teachers of the craft were less literate, the traditions and moral teachings of Freemasonry might be lost. It is for this reason that the ritual was devised, so that all who taught their brethren would have a uniform method of instruction, 
It is believed that these rituals were contained in lectures that were uniform and delivered to the new entered apprentices and fellow crafts. These lectures then contained a uniform set of words that were transmitted orally from generation to the next. After the formation of the first Grand Lodge, these lectures became included in the ancient charges and were later printed in the first constitution written by Dr. James Anderson in 1723. They became known as the Anderson Constitution. At the same time, Dr. Anderson, assisted by Dr. de Saglier, changed the form of these lectures into a question-and-answer format. These question-and-answers lectures were divided into three sections. These questions-and-answer lectures were so well-liked that the Grand Lodge of England adopted them for use in all lodges. This was the first uniform use of what later became known as our ritual. It was later decided that these lectures needed revision. This was accomplished in 1732 by Martin Clare, Deputy Grand Master. He included some moral and scriptural admonitions and mention of the human senses and the theological ladder. Further changes and improvements to the quote-unquote lectures were made. The lectures were made more Christian in nature. It should be remembered that in the earlier days of operative Masonic lodges, the craft was largely employed by the church to build their magnificent edifices. In the year 1763, Reverend William Hutchinson believed that the third degree was exclusively Christian in nature. He stated that the three degrees were references to the three dispensations, the patriarchal, mosaic, and the Christian. He even believed that the word Mason meant a member of a religious sect. This was due to the required belief in God. He further thought that the three degrees were a progression of the three steps of the theological school of thought. The first step was the knowledge of God the second step, the worship of God under Jewish law, and the third step was the Christian dispensation, which was the highest religious step that could be attained. It was in these steps that Hutchinson set up the three great pillars, wisdom, strength, and beauty. He also introduced the cardinal virtues of prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice. He also gave the star its Christian significance. In 1772, the Hutchinson lectures were replaced by the lectures of William Preston. These lectures not only revised the Hutchinson lectures, but extended the information taught. These new lectures continued until the unification of the two existing Grand Lodges in the United Grand Lodge of England in the year 1813. A brother Hemmings was a chairman of the committee that worked with the lectures, and the lectures became known as the Hemmings Lectures. During the time of the division of Freemasonry into two Grand Lodges, Differences crept into the lectures. The committee endeavored to have a system whereby there was a uniform group of lectures that were in agreement with the ancient landmarks, a compromise with the two systems of lectures used by the two Grand Lodges. There are some interesting differences between the Hemmings lectures and those used today. The lodges were dedicated to Moses and Solomon rather than the two Saints John. They introduced the working tools of the entered apprentice as being the 24-inch rule, a gavel, and a chisel. The working tools of a master mason were a pair of compasses, a skirret, and a pencil. The ornaments of a lodge of master masons were a porch, a dormer, and a stone pavement. Dr. Hemmings removed the references to Christianity. These lectures were not favorable to the brethren and were never really adopted for common use. Preston's lectures were made the regularly utilized lectures approved by the new United Grand Lodge. The first published monitor was that drafted in 1797. In 1801 to 1802, Benjamin Gleason was a student at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. He was given the lectures and was made the first Grand Lecturer in the United States by order of Isaiah Thomas, the Grand Master of Massachusetts. Brother Gleason was commissioned as Grand Lecturer of all the lodges under his jurisdiction. The term Grand Lecturer, as used today, stems from the division of the original lectures that taught new Masons the work into the question and answer ritual that is used in current times. In the year 1806, Thomas Thompson, Grand Master of New Hampshire, asked the Grand Master of Massachusetts to appoint a committee with members of both Grand Lodges in attendance to be charged with conferring on Masonic subjects and especially to devise a system of uniform work and lectures. The committee met and established such a uniform structure of lectures for the three degrees. They also decided that every master of a lodge should be indulged with the liberty of adopting historical details and the personification of the passing scene as most agreeable to himself, his supporting officers, and assisting lodge.
In 1810, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts adopted this report and the resulting ritual. The Grand Lodge directed that this be communicated to all of the lodges in its jurisdiction. This then was delivered to other Grand Lodges in the country. The foregoing history of our lecture was the state of affairs at the time it was written in 1915. Since then, each state Masonic jurisdiction has adopted a uniform set of lectures or ritual that is mandatory for each lodge in its jurisdiction. There may be some differences in ritual as utilized in the various jurisdictions. However, the basic tenets of each ritual are uniform. It is to the benefit of our fraternity that changes to the ritual are hard to come by. It is only by the system of changes by the Grand Board of Examiners and our Grand Lodge that changes to the ritual should be made. As it can be seen, our fraternity is the oldest and most successful fraternal organization in the world. It is by the continuance of this process of teaching our brethren that our brotherhood continues. There you have that piece, and it, it really speaks to the way things are codified here in the Grand Lodge of Illinois. We have a board of grand examiners. They guard the work. Our work is printed. We have floor work manuals, and all of our words are printed except for the uh, just certain secret parts of the ritual which are not codified in print. But the rest of it is. So we don't, we don't usually have this question of multiple past masters saying to us, oh, it's this way. Oh, you do it this way. Nope, we can actually... Every lodge, anybody, not just certain people, can pull out the book and go, nope, it's this, actually. This is the word, or this is the verbiage. So that is pretty interesting in and of itself. But some different, quote-unquote, lectures I had never heard of before. The Hemings Lectures, for instance, had no idea that lodges used to be dedicated to Moses and Solomon. I almost wonder if that's the product of the moderns. And, of course, the ancients won out, even though the moderns were way cooler. Uh, just ask Joe Wages. He can tell you all about it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week. I hope you enjoyed the program. Thanks to everybody out there who is supporting us, buying pins and all of that good stuff. I am pretty much booked up for this year as far as speaking goes. It's a long shot, but if you need somebody to come out and do a talk, let me know. I can probably swing Skype talks right now this year for 2019, but uh, for the most part, 2019 is pretty booked up. So I want to thank all all of the lodges who are having me out. Uh, just recently, I spoke at Victorville Lodge, where we had a bunch of brothers come out, and I gave a three and a half hour straight lecture with, well, I guess two or three 10 minute breaks in between. But it was fantastic to share time. And I got to give a shout out to my brother Jack, who really took care of me that weekend, and also to brother Rick, who was so gracious and uh, actually took Jack and I up in his airplane. And I have never in my life seen the California coast that way. It was breathtaking and talk about a new perspective on the planet. He wasn't kidding when it, he said it was so beautiful to be at that altitude. We, we flew at about 5,000 to 7,500 feet and just right up the coast. And it was the coolest thing. You know, I, I come from California. It's where I grew up and never quite done anything like that before. The only time I had ever seen the land like that, right, is when takeoff and landing. Uh, this was incredible. So I want to thank Brother Rick, Brother Gonzo, Brother Villa, or Villa. I'm sorry if I didn't say it properly. You guys were so incredible. And I just want to say thank you. That's it for this week. Again, hope you enjoyed. We'll talk to you all real soon next week for episode 390. You're not going to want to miss it. We're going to have something really cool. And uh, episode 400, right around the corner, I got a lot of you with the April Fool's joke. I said we were only going to have 400 episodes. I said 12 episodes left. It's been an honor and a privilege. And of course, it really has been an honor and a privilege, but we are not stopping at 400. We will continue to bring Masonic Light as best we can and as long as you all will listen. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 